Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here. This is a really, um, really cool festival, a beautiful city. Um, I'm, I'm honored that I was asked to join, and I wanted to thank uh, Beatrice and Christian and uh, Ramona for having me and thinking of me. Um, I also love that this festival is called Unfinished. I feel like that lets us all off the hook. Um, I feel like I could walk off the stage right now and I'd be justified in doing that. Um, so I'm gonna talk about vulnerability uh, and vulnerability as power. Are you guys feeling vulnerable? Well, of course you're not because you're sitting down there and I'm standing up here. Um, I'm feeling vulnerable. I'm, I feel like if I were to honor this um, theme properly, uh, I would have come out here naked and unprepared. <laughs> but there are inappropriate kinds of vulnerability and there are appropriate kinds of vulnerability. And what I'm encouraging is the appropriate kind um, having to do with love. I'm going to ask and attempt to answer six questions. And these questions are, what is vulnerability? Why am I an authority on vulnerability? How can, can we avoid feeling vulnerable? Is there a way to go through life avoiding that? Uh, when can't we avoid it? Can we force vulnerability? And how can creativity drawn from vulnerability change humanity? So what, what is vulnerability? Uh, I, I have a definition. Um, and, and we think of vulnerability as being weakness. Uh, and, and that's certainly what the definition is. The quality or state of being exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed either physically or emotionally. So to be vulnerable is to be exposed. Um, it's to be vulnerable is to want something that you don't ne aren't necessarily in control of being able to get. Uh, that can be professional. Um, it, it can be uh, in terms of possessions, um, wealth. Um, but it, it comes to... Um, it sort of comes to a peak in love and relationships and expressing what you want from someone else uh, in love or relationship and having that person say, they don't want the same thing you want. This is something that everyone goes through. Um, everyone who wants <laughs> goes through feeling exposed and vulnerable and able to be... Um, disappointed and crushed. You know, if you think of vulnerability in other terms, like a castle, uh, the vulnerable part is where the advancing army comes through. Uh, if a software program has a vulnerability, that's, where, that's how the virus gets in. If uh, in a herd of zebras, the, the most vulnerable zebra is the one that gets eaten by a lion. These are all ways that vulnerability feels like a weakness. Um, but human beings are not castles, and we're not uh, software. And we're a little bit closer to zebras, um, but we're not zebras either. Um, we are not built to keep people out. Human beings are not built to keep people out. We're, we're built to invite people in, uh, to have people know us. Um, to be known, and, but, but letting yourself be known in all of your weaknesses and desires is really, really scary. And so people try to stay away from it. Why am I an authority on vulnerability? Uh, I'm going to answer this in two ways. Um, personally, I'm not an authority on, on vulnerability. In my personal life, uh, I'm a total coward when it comes to, to love and relationships. 
and uh, my wife, who's sitting here in the audience in the second row, um, can attest to that. I, I, I wanted, I want, you know, do you have to take risk to gain things in life, and especially in love? And I didn't want, I never wanted to take risks to gain something, I just wanted to gain the thing. Uh, and we sort of bumbled along in our relationship with, I think we were together for two years, um, and we were, at that point, 29 years old. It, uh, it seemed like it was time that we were going to decide whether we should get married or not get married. And someone needed to make a move. And, and that person just wasn't going to be me. <laughs> I just it was like, it wasn't, I wasn't afraid of being married. I was afraid of saying, will you marry me? And so we were, so had this sort of romantic weekend in San Francisco. And uh, we were on a ferry going from San, across San Francisco Bay to Sausalito. And Kathy said, um, so are we going to get married or not? And I said, yeah, I guess we should. And that was it. That was like our big romantic moment, our big uh, proposal. Um, but we, we celebrate next month our 25th anniversary, so I, it couldn't have been that bad, right? Um, professionally, for some reason, I am an authority on vulnerability because for the past almost 13 years, I've edited a column in the New York Times called Modern Love. Uh, this is a personal essay column, for those of you who don't know it, where, where people um, write in 1,500 words. It's just uh, two-thirds of a newspaper page. What's often the most um, painful and uh, revealing um, story of their lives. And I feel like I'm a vulnerability merchant. You know, I buy these, these people's stories and work with them to put it in the paper, and then I sort of shepherd them through the process. And sometimes I feel sort of like a psychotherapist in dealing with them. But these are people who, um, who not only are willing to talk about the, the disappointments in their lives, not only willing to confront them in their, in their private lives and write about them and come clean about, about who they are and what they want, um, but then they're willing to go public with that. And this is public in a big way. This, this column has anywhere from hundreds of thousands to, uh, for some popular columns, millions of readers, in one case, uh, almost 20 million readers for a really popular column. That's a lot of people that you're inviting into your life and inviting into your struggles. And not only have I worked with all those people for, for almost 13 years, but I read um, some 8,000 essays a year to figure out which of the 52 we're going to publish every year. And over, you know, 12 and a half years, that's probably 75,000 essays where I've gotten far enough into them. I don't read all of all of them, but I read enough to know what people are dealing with and what scares them and what they want um, and what their disappointments are. And that um, has been an education in vulnerability. And I, and I want to talk to you about sort of what I've learned from that. Can we avoid feeling vulnerable? is question number three. And people who are really good, it turns out, in avoiding vulnerability are college students and people in their early 20s. Over about the past 10 years, I've held college essay contests nationwide, and we get about you know, 1,500 to 2,000 essays from college students. And each each time we've done it these four times, it's been sort of a, um, an education in how you can avoid uh, vulnerability, how you can avoid sh showing your true self, um, how you can avoid any sense of commitment. And I don't say that as a criticism at all. Um, we are vulnerable when we, when we want to be, when we need to be vulnerable to move our lives to the next level. You don't want to take risks when you don't want the thing at the end of the risk. And what I've discovered, in, in, at least in the United States, and people who are 
in their late teens, and it continues, you know, in 25, 26, 27, is that people don't want a relationship to be the main thing in their lives. They, it's not the right time, but they still want sex. They still want friendship. They still want uh, intimacy of a certain kind, but they want it in little packages that are controllable. And so that, that requires sort of shutting off parts of yourself. And the first time we held this contest, the, 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 the theme that most people were writing about was hooking up um, and just having sex without, without commitment and uh, not having any emotional involvement. So it's all physical relationships with no emotional involvement. And people were protecting themselves that way. And it just felt like the safe way to, to get halfway into a relationship, but not all the way. And there, there were all kinds of consequences to that. You know, it's hard to not feel what you feel, um, no matter how you try to press it back. But, but the idea was, I'm not gonna get hurt. I'm gonna have sex, which is fun and satisfying, but I'm not gonna get hurt. Um, the next time we held the contest, I thought we'd just get the same thing. And instead, the theme had really changed almost completely and this was just over a period of three or four years, uh, because I feel like that age group is always experimenting with a, be with a better way of going about relationships and everything else. And so, that, so the next time, it was three or four years later, students were mostly writing about online-only relationships. They'd meet someone at a conference or at some school event who didn't live close to them and strike up this very deep relationship online through whatever social network they were, they were a part of. And these would turn into intense, intense relationships that were all emotional. The other ones were all physical with no emotion. And these were all emotion with no physical contact whatsoever. So again, it was this, this thing that sustained them but was completely controllable. And you could, they could just shut down the laptop and the, and the relationship ended. And, uh, it was, it, was, it was so interesting to me to see how, again, people were just picking and choosing little pieces because they don't want a whole relationship until they're at the point where they want that to be the focal uh, point of their lives or at least as, as an equivalent need to, um, to their career. Then the next, the next um, stage of the contest, it had sort of moved on to doing whatever, which had to do with sleeping together or... Um, or being together uh, as, as friends, but also you'd have sex every once in a while, whatever. But there would be no label put on whatever you were doing. You, there was never any stage that you would pass where you would become, um, you would call yourself being in a relationship, or that you would use a term like boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, it was all... Um, it was, never, it was never spoken about. So you, you would be with this person, they were, they, they were important to you, you were important to them, but no terminology was ever used to describe the relationship. And the consequence to that, at least in the prize-winning essay that year, was that, at least from the woman's perspective, um, the guy lost interest in her but their relationship never ended because it had never really begun. So she never felt like they'd broken up because they'd never really started going out, even though they were, they were good friends, they slept together, <laughs> they'd done everything as intimately as people can do things, but there was no starting point, no end point, and no feeling for her of, of, of resolution for her then to move on to the next person because it had never been discussed. Discussing what the relationship was was a threat to the relationship. We just finished our, our fourth college essay contest last month, and <laughs> this one had so many scenes that was the same, the same scene repeated again and again and again. And I said to the two people who were reading the college essays with me, um, do you suppose this is the same guy appearing in all of these essays? And this guy was the guy who, um, where the woman starts to feel more like she wants the relationship to go to the next level is the guy who says, oh, whoa, 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 <laughs> and gets scared off. 
as soon as any, any part of the relationship is discussed. And in the quintessential scene that represented um, this, this group of, of 2,000 or so college students was a scene where uh, the woman says, I, they're lying in bed together, and she's like, I, I like you. It was as simple as that. She said, I like you. And he said, what? Like, what? Like, he just didn't want to deal with having someone say, I like you. That was too much for him to take on. And he actually just got up and got dressed and left. And she chased after him and said, she's like chasing him down the street. And she's saying, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I don't really like you. I don't care. I don't care any more than you do. And it occurred to me that this is a, this used to be, you used to chase the person down the street to win them back and say, I love you, I really love you. Come back, I really love you. And now you chase the person down the street saying, I don't care about you. Can we go back to what we had? Um, it's an extreme example, but it's representative of how, um, at least in the United States, people of that, that age are afraid of, what they're really afraid of is commitment, but it comes out as a fear of vulnerability. And, and that vulnerability is going to if they reveal what they want, if they reveal who they really are, it will lead a relationship to a stage that they don't want it to be. Question four, what, what makes us embrace vulnerability? And these are the stories that, that we've published that, uh, that really move me and, and sort of tear me apart. And, I wanted to just read you a couple of passages from, from a couple of essays, two essays that we published that are about, about people who face really grave choices. And, and they, um, they move toward sort of being really vulnerable instead of retreating from it. And it, it makes all the difference. You know, it's the difference between being a, a quality human being and being a coward. Um, the, the first is, is by a woman named Elizabeth Fitzsimons. And just to give you a little background, because I'm just going to read a short part. Elizabeth Fitzsimons and her husband um, couldn't have their own children. They adopted a, a baby girl, an infant girl from China, and it, because it takes a while for all of the paperwork to clear and all of that, it was, I think, eight months where they had this picture on their refrigerator of this, girl, this infant that they had adopted before they could go to China and get her. Um, they, they go to China, they meet the girl, they take the girl back to the hotel room, and, she's, and they, they undress her for the first time. And she's really damaged. She has a, a scar on, her, on the base of her spine. Um, she just seems sort of sickly and damaged beyond um, the typical malnourishment or something like that that you would expect with, it, with a child who's, who's been raised in an or, or been in an orphanage, orphanage up until then. So here, this takes up the story from there. Back at the hotel, we hounded the women from the agency. Why wasn't this in her medical report? How could a scar of that size not be noticed? It was two inches long, for God's sake. The representatives from the adoption agency shook their heads, shrugged, apologized, and then they offered a way to make it better. In cases like these, we could make a rematch with another baby, the one in charge said. The rest of the process would be expedited and we would go home on schedule. We would simply leave with a different girl. Months before, we had been presented with forms asking which disabilities would be acceptable in a, in a prospective adoptee. What, in other words, did we think we could handle? HIV, hepatitis, blindness? We checked off a few mild problems that we knew could be swiftly corrected with proper medical care. As Matt had written on our application, her husband, this will be our first child, and we feel we would need more experience to handle anything more serious. 
Now we face surgeries, wheelchairs, colostomy bags. I envisioned our home in San Diego with ramps leading to the doors. I saw our lives as being utterly devoted to her care. How would we ever manage? Yet how could we leave her? Had I given birth to a child with these conditions, I wouldn't have left her at the hospital. Though a friend would later say, well, that's different. It wasn't to me. I pictured myself boarding the plane with some faceless replacement child and then explaining to friends and family that she wasn't Natalie, that we had left Natalie in China because she was too damaged, that the deal had been a healthy baby and she wasn't. How would I face myself? How would I ever forget? I knew this was my test, my life's worth distilled into a moment. I was shaking my head no before they even finished explaining. We didn't want another baby, I told them. We wanted our baby, the one sleeping right over there. She's our daughter, I said. We love her. That, to me, is the power of vulnerability, of, of walking into that choice with eyes open, like this is not what you wanted, it was not what you think you could take. Um, after, this essay ran many years ago, and afterward I, I just thought, like, what would I have done in that situation? I'm a young parent, we're in, we're in China, here's a baby who's promised to have medical problems, severe medical problems her whole life, or you can have the baby behind door number two who's healthy. Which do you choose? Do you choose to leave this child at home? Or do you just walk away completely? And after this essay ran, I mean, I thought I would not take the damaged baby. Like, that's where I feel like I'm ashamed of myself, you know, and shame drives a lot of these things. I feel like I, I could not do that, but she didn't either, and she did. Um, after that piece ran, we heard from all kinds of people who did make the other choice, who, who had gotten, you know, been set up with babies in China and just uh, something wasn't right and they walked away and left, left the child there. Or they did this, the switch and took a different child. And as she said, like, how do you live with yourself in that circumstance? And that's what I thought too, but they walked headlong into it. Ironically, the baby turned out to be fine <laughs> over over the next few years. She went through like a year of trouble and then turned out to be a totally, totally healthy child. And these, all these diagnoses that were done in China, looking, looking at bad CAT scans, turned out to be misread. The next story uh, is by a, a Canadian soldier named Benj Benjamin Hertwig. And this one starts at the beginning, so I will just uh, read it to you, and then um, I'll explain a little bit in the middle, and then go to the end. I googled counseling and scrolled through pages of possibilities before finally settling on a female psychologist with a kind face. Later that week, I went to her office wanting to talk about infidelity and broken trust, but somehow we ended up talking about sex and guilt. I cried a lot. Eight years earlier, when I was 20, I had served in Afghanistan as a machine gunner in a security pl platoon that accompanied convoys, a six-month tour of grinding tedium interspersed with episodes of unpredictable violence and death. But that's not what drove me to the psychologist's office. I went because my marriage had fallen apart. My wife had had an affair. As is often the case in marriage, the infidelity was more a symptom of our trouble than its cause. Their situation was typical. They met through work. One evening before I knew what was happening, the three of us were out at the same fundraising event, and at one point, he and my wife ducked outside for a smoke, and I was left alone. So his wife was having an affair with his coworker. He finds out about it. He goes to counseling. After he'd been at counseling for several weeks, he goes to the counselor's office, and in the, in the waiting room is the wife of 
his, his wife's lover. <laughs> Seeking counseling from the same counselor for the same affair, um, but from her, for, for, from her side, and this is in a big city, this is in Vancouver, Canada, so it's not like he was the only counselor in town. This is very healing for him. Um, he's so angry. He's angry at having been a soldier and come back to have his marriage fall apart, um, partly because of that. He's angry and feels, and feels emasculated and threatened by this other man. But instead of being embittered um, and self-pitying, which sort of stunt you emotionally, if, you, if, you, if that's all you feel, he decided that he would, he would forgive or it wasn't even so much a decision as he, um, he met this, this woman's boy, the son of the, man, of the man who his wife had the affair with, who was this little boy. And he became friends with this boy. And here's what he says about that. In the months that followed, thinking of my ex-wife's lover as that sweet boy's father was somehow very helpful to me. I had held Catherine's boy, felt the good weight of his body, and eventually I learned that it's hard to hate a person when that person was part of bringing something good into the world. So he takes this situation where he just could feel like a victim and could just withdraw and protect himself. And instead he just sort of goes headlong into, into forgiveness um, and is a, better, is a better person for it. He, he sort of opens himself up to love for love again. Question five, can vulnerability be artificially forced? Yes. The most popular column that we've ever run in the paper was by a woman named Mandy Lancatron, and it was titled, To Fall in Love with Anyone, Do This. And this was a woman who, this just came out two years ago, who uh, had, her previous relationship had failed, and she wanted to find a way through psychology and science to love smarter and to, to fall in love in a more deliberate way. And, um, so, and she read an experiment by a psychologist named Arthur Aaron, who back in the 90s had come up with this experiment where if you ask, if you sit down with a, a total stranger and ask, each other these 36 questions and then stare into each other's eyes for four minutes, which is a really long time to stare into someone's eyes, that you increase your chances of falling in love. Um, so she wanted to give this a try. She did it with, um, with not a total stranger, but someone she didn't no, but just an acquaintance, someone who was, went to the same climbing gym that she went to. This was also in Vancouver, this story. And they asked each other these 36 questions. They um, did the staring into the eyes, and they fell in love, and now, two years later, they're planning on getting married. So this essay came out in the paper, and I don't know if it was a combination of that experiment and how appealing that was. Um, Partially, it was the headline that drew, drew a lot of people in, but this essay was, essay was read by nearly 20 million people around the world. Um, people made documentaries about it. It, was, um, it just caught fire uh, like nothing else we've ever done to that extent. And the questions are, are kind of brilliant. It sounds like a gimmick, but the questions are about, so what's so hard about meeting a new person and getting to know them is that one person has to, to push it and then there's always the risk that the other person's going to retreat. And so whoever, whoever's asking the questions or, and revealing the most to the other person, you have to be in perfect sync, and no one's ever in perfect sync. Like, one person's always taking more of a risk. And by having these questions, it equalizes the, the sharing and the vulnerability. You each have to answer the questions, and the questions get progressively more um, probing. And... Uh, I think it takes like, a, it's supposed to take like an hour that you, that you go through these questions. And it's, you know, we talk about falling in love as a, um, as a fantasy. And I think it's dangerous to talk about it as a fantasy because all it really is is getting to know someone really well in a way that makes them appealing. I mean, there's sort of looks and physical and sex appeal, and that's one thing. 
But that only stays at a certain level. And then, and beyond that, it's, it's compatibility and um, really knowing someone and having them know you. And this, this forces that into a compressed period of time and makes it equal. So it's a game, but it's a very sophisticated game. And these are just some of the, some of the sample questions. Um, it's 36 questions in three sets. Uh, and these are just some of the ones that I think are the most, most interesting. Given the choice of anyone in the world, whom would you want to have as a dinner guest? This is question seven. Do you have a secret hunch about how you will die? Does anybody? <laughs> I can't really see. <laughs> Who wants to answer? Come on, I'm the only one being vulnerable here. Who has a secret hunch about how they will die? Nobody does? <laughs> My wife is going to answer? <laughs> uh, oh, that's true. Okay, I'll let you off the hook with that. Um, number nine, for what in your life do you feel most the most grateful? Number ten, if you could change anything about the way you were raised, what, it would, what would it be? Anyone can shout out answers at any point here if you want to, want to take any of these on. Number 12, if you, could, if you could wake up tomorrow having gained any one quality or ability, what would it be? Set number two. Question 13, if a crystal ball could tell you the truth about yourself, your life, the future, or anything else, what would you want to know? <laughs> what was it? How you're gonna die? <laughs> um, 14, is there something that you've dreamed of doing for a long time, why haven't you done it? Question 15, what is the greatest accomplishment of your life? Number 17, what is your most treasured memory? 19, if you knew that in one year you would die suddenly, would you change anything about the way you are living now? Why? 24, this is an interesting one to me. I'll, I'll explain why. How do you feel about your relationship with your mother? He doesn't have people ask, how do you feel about the relationship with your father? So people's m relationships with their mothers must be more interesting and more revealing than their relationships with their fathers. Sad for people like me. <laughs> What's that? That's true too. But he, he, you'd think the questions would be equal. Um, set three, uh, I asked this at a, at a s class I was speaking to once. The answer was very predictable. Your house containing everything you own catches fire. After saving your loved ones and pets, you have time to safely make a final dash to save any one item. What would it be and why? So everyone said their, their phone. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's what we've come to. Rushing back for the phone. Some people have more, and a more intimate relationship with their phone than, than any living person. Okay, so coming around to the theme of the conference, how can creativity drawn from vulnerability change humanity? As I was explaining earlier, a modern love essay um, involves two acts of vulnerability. There's the private act of, right, of, of experiencing the story, and then and writing about it. And then there's the very public act of, of, of putting it out there for hundreds of thousands or, or millions of people to read. Um, both, both of those acts can be terrifying, but, but in different ways. And these people just, just walk straight into it. And I, and I think it's to the benefit of us all that people do. And this is not just writers, this is photographers, this is painters, this is anyone who's, who's willing to take that risk and talk about being vulnerable, to put your story out there for criticism and judgment, um, to put your photographs out there for people to say, why is that any good? 
Um, those are acts of vulnerability that, that are really gifts and offerings. And that, when I'm talking about vulnerability as being power, this is where it gets supercharged. This is, this is real vulnerability as power. It's, it's taking what's inside of you and not just putting it out there for others to absorb, but thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, and allowing them to see that they're not, they're not alone um, in their struggles, which are probably the same. Um, human beings learn from storytelling. And you know, ever since people would paint on cave walls, um, you know, now there's seven billion people on Earth. Cave walls don't really cut it anymore. Now it's mass media and storytelling, and this is how, how we learn to, to live our lives and be um, better people. I see modern love as a venue that can use personal stories to increase empathy and understanding on a broad scale, and sometimes that scale is, is very broad. It's like, I feel like it's throwing a pebble into the ocean and having it turn into a tsunami, practically, in terms of who it reaches. Um, the readership of the New York Times is um, in the millions, the subscriber base is in the millions. Every time Donald Trump tweets about us and calls us failing or fake news, we get tens of thousands of more subscribers. Um, there's also a, a Modern Love podcast that has hundreds of thousands of listeners every week and had 20 million downloads in the first year. This is, um, involves actors. Um, Colin Farrell, Emmy Rossum, Angela Bassett, people like that read, read these stories and they get turned into sort of movies for your ears. And then I and the writer and the host uh, talk about the issues that the, that the stories raise. And we've done live versions of the, of the podcast in big theaters in New York and Boston. Um, there's a Modern Love TV show in the works that also will take these stories and, and create them and reimagine them in a whole, whole new way. Um, the possibilities are endless. And you never know who is paying attention and who is reading or listening to these things. Um, I know that Michelle Obama is a reader of the column because she wrote to one of the essayists after her essay ran at one point and said that she was. Um, Ivanka Tr Trump is a fan of our podcast, it turns out. She has tweeted um, about it twice and told people to listen to it. Um, I'm not really a fan of Ivanka Trump, but I, who knows what's going to make a difference? I, I even just feel like the fact that she listens to this and enjoys it um, makes me think she's an empathetic person who, who uh, can be a positive force. Um, all you can do is, is hope that it will lead to, these things will lead to empathy and understanding, and you try to open hearts and minds however you can. Um, mostly, though, the act of sharing these intense, intimate stories through, through this act I've seen happen again and again in 12 years is how it encourages others to be more empathetic in their private lives. A public act of vulnerability on this scale tends to spur all kinds of private acts of vulnerability within relationships. I know this because I hear it every week. Here's one letter we received after we published an essay. This is such a, such a strange essay. It's about a, an, uh, an Amish woman who'd grown up, I don't know if you're familiar with the Amish um, life in America, but it's, it's very conservative, religious, horse and buggy kind of... Um, a, uh, very, just conservative religion with no mass media or anything, and certainly um, shielded from current life. And this was a, an unusual story about a woman in an Amish family who was gay, and that was just not something that could ever come out. She couldn't talk about it for her whole life. And finally, when she was, I think, in her, in her 60s, she... Um, came out to her family, um, and they were surprised, <laughs> but they accepted her in a way that she didn't expect, and it was a really touching story, almost more touching to me, was this letter we received in response. To whom it may concern, 
A friend forwarded, me, forwarded this article to me due to its strikingly relevant content. I am a young person living in the heart of Lancaster County. Lancaster County is in Pennsylvania, which is deeply, deeply Amish. And I have been struggling with my identity for years. For months leading up to the Supreme Court decision on gay marriage, I had to hear friends, family, and people I looked up to spew hatred against the, quote, sexually immoral and those who threaten traditional family values. Not divorced people or cheating spouses, mind you, not even exploring teenagers. No, specifically, they meant the gays, the mentally ill population who rebelled against what God intended. In recent years, the congregation has become more bold in their bigotry, and I realized that even if I wanted to, I could never confess my, quote, sins to these people. I cannot confide in my own brothers and sisters in Christ. My faith has become increasingly private. I have become fed up with the conservatism of my community. I hate the idea that whatever way I choose, either a happy partnership or a happy community, I will be forced to sacrifice something important to me. I hate the idea that I will never find happiness the same way that my friends and family have. Reading this article has given me much hope. First, with the happiness of knowing that I'm not alone. Second, it gave me hope that maybe, just maybe, I won't be met with hatred if I ever decide to come out. In so many ways, the world is a better place for people like us. But I'm young and meek. I am terrified, and I am full of love for those around me, and I want to keep on loving. Thank you for speaking out and sharing your story. You have given a young girl hope on a day that feels a little dark. Sincerely, Lily. <clears throat> and that, in my view, is how creativity, driven by vulnerability, can change humanity. Thank you.